So our next speaker, Dr. Robert A. Cook. Uh, many of you will have seen Rob at previous conferences. Rob has spent most of his working life in the university field as an academic, an associate professor, now emeritus of management at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He was previously an associate research scientist at the University of Michigan Survey Research Center and a visiting scholar at Stanford University. 2004, Rob stepped aside from his academic commitments to become the global CEO for Human Synergistics and thus the emeritus status and he has had a lifetime of research in the fields of organisational culture and leadership. He's the author of over 75 articles, chapters and technical reports and his research has appeared in many of the most prestigious peer-reviewed academic journals. As the brain behind most of our diagnostics, you might have noticed Rob's name at the bottom of your report, if you've had one. These include the Organisational Culture Inventory, the Organisational Effectiveness Inventory and the Leadership Impact Tool. So before I welcome uh, Rob to the stage, I'd also like Dr Janet Zumel to stand up, please. Janet is the author of uh, Apart from being uh, Rob's partner in life, he's all, she's also his partner in research uh, and materials development. So those of you who have received feedback through the Management Impact Report, that's one of her babies, uh, the Organisational Culture Interpretation Guide and a number of other publications. So that's it for me. Please join me in welcoming Dr Robert Cook to the stage. It is absolutely wonderful being here today and being able to talk with you again. Uh, this has been a, a fantastic morning. We had a fantastic conference in Melbourne. Just uh, wonderfully inspirational talks by Jen, by Kate, by Michael. We're going to have another great talk right after me. Um, I, want to let, I want to let you know that I'm here to sort of give you a break from all that inspiration and excitement <laughs> and uh, share with you uh, some research-oriented stuff and thinking around organizational culture. So, you know, put yourself in the mindset that it's uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, all right, you're in that required MBA course, you're going to get out of here soon, maybe half an hour, and everything's going to be fine. Also, the good news is there will be no, no quiz, all right? so. With that in mind, um, we will be talking about uh, the word of the year of 2014, culture. And a lot of that, uh, at least in the United States, is um, also organizational culture, workplace culture, corporate culture. Uh, it's, it's really, really taken off. Um, things are quite a bit different than it was years ago. Uh, just so you know, just, just so I was convinced that culture was used as much here as it is in the United States, I picked up a couple newspapers every day and looked in the business finance sections to see if culture was in there. And I want you to know the banks and the financial services organizations here are doing me a big favor because at least once a day, culture was in there around uh, that particular industry. Strategy and uh, study done actually the year before culture was named uh, the word of the year really confirms that uh, from a strategy company, no less, that organizational culture is extraordinarily important. I'd like to think about how different things are now around the words organizational culture when years ago those two words really were never used together. When I first started talking about organizational culture and the organizational culture inventory, writing it around 1982, 1983, I would ask people, people in organizations, would you be interested in trying our organizational culture survey? And they would look at me and basically say, well, what's that? They would say, do you mean climate? Well, not sure what you're, what you're talking about here. Organizational culture really was not recognized as a legitimate organizational behavior construct back then. It wasn't taught in our classes. It wasn't in our textbooks. Leadership development programs 
really did not include organizational culture. Nowadays, it is recognized, it's legitimate, and as we say in the US, it's, it's very hot as a concept. Uh, perceived impact of organizational culture. Back then, um, people would ask, Does, do you think this has any effect on how well we do as an organization? In other words, does it really matter? There was very little evidence of uh, the importance of culture in the 1980s. I was personally convinced that it was extremely important, but it really wasn't, uh, really wasn't seen that way back then. Uh, nowadays, um, the perceived impact of culture is recognized worldwide. In fact, all these things are attributed to organizational culture, good or bad, and it's almost a knee-jerk reaction to blame a problem or attribute a success to culture. So you want to know why 10 million cars were produced that uh, apparently did not meet emission standards? Well, according to the press, at least, it's organizational culture. Our understanding of organizational culture. 30, 30, 35 years ago, the understanding was relatively low. As, uh, sort of a, as I said before, a new way of looking at organizations, something new to measure, something new to develop and improve. I think we've made progress since then, but um, progress in this arena has not been quite as significant as the progress in the other two arenas. Um, organizational cultures um, really a set of shared beliefs, said shared values, assumptions that lead to norms and expectations, somewhat invisible, that truly do guide the way people and organizations interact with others and approach their work. But um, in organizations, in the world of consulting, it's often not regarded that way, it's often not measured that way. So oftentimes people look at um, more visible things like involvement or mission or engagement, et cetera, sort of climate type factors that truly are not organizational culture. Um, culture we see as being relatively invisible. Secondly, um, with, with organizational culture and particularly the measurement of culture, um, it's becoming a little bit more simplistic than it should be. There are these very brief surveys that purportedly measure culture and possibly they do give a pulse on culture, but we believe, we continue to believe that to truly understand the culture of an organization and maybe more importantly, to do something constructive about it, you truly have to ask a lot of questions, both through surveys as well as through qualitative methods. And unless you do that, you'll probably be focusing on something that is not quite as impactful as culture. Third, over the past 25 years, uh, the term culture has been used very frequently in conjunction with other words. So a blank culture or a culture for blank, et cetera. It's one of the reasons why organizational culture or culture more specifically became the word of the year. People talk about culture all the time in relation to specific outcomes or specific problems within not only organizational settings, but other settings as well. And in organizations, we very, very frequently see the emergence of uh, various types of cultures, like what you're going to see on the screen. In some cases, these other cultures sort of inadvertently emerge, um, possibly due to reward systems that are put into place, our performance appraisal systems or structures or technologies that lead to cultures in these specific areas. In other, case, in other cases, organizations and their consultants, their members, their leaders have attacked certain problems, have targeted certain problems like these around safety, around innovation, around diversity, around innovation, et cetera, with specialized 
cultures that are very problem specific, very problem oriented. Many of these problems that are addressed, that are addressed by these specific cultures, these problem oriented cultures are critical. Um, the, the, the problems around reliability of organizations are extremely important, uh, particularly large-scale organizations where um, the, the consequences of an accident are more or less catastrophic, nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear aircraft carriers, uh, certain defense systems um, where the OCI has been used uh, extensively, and in um, regular fossil fuel, uh, elect electricity power organizations and uh, paper and pulp companies. Uh, the, the, the importance of safety for the individuals is just paramount. And I, I do very much understand the importance of having specialized cultures, like a culture for safety or reliability culture, but I worry that those specialized cultures are somewhat detached from the organization, are somewhat out of alignment with um, the overall organizational culture, and therefore are not as effective as they really should be. There, there has been a debate and controversy in, um, in the area of safety for many years now. Uh, I was very interested in it in the early 1990s. I actually wrote a, um, a survey around safety. It was called the Human Systems Reliability Survey. Um, many of the items that are in there are in the organizational effectiveness inventory now. Um, a number of the people that uh, were in the area of safety were saying that, you know, we, we don't want to look at overall organizational culture. What we want to do is to shape to create a culture for safety and be very specific about that culture. We'll start from scratch in trying to identify it. The debate continues as to whether or not the safety culture should be specific to safety or whether or not it should be totally embedded within the larger organizational culture and the larger system of organizational values. These are just two quotes up here, one by a safety consultant at top, one by a professor of safety at the bottom. And their quotes indicate, you know, it really should not be done that way. And looking forward, we should embed safety cultures within the larger cultures of organizations. Some of the reasons, um, why I'm thinking that um, we need greater alignment, greater embeddedness of these problem-centered cultures with overall organizational cultures are listed up here. You know, if, if, if we're creating, if we're shaping a constructive culture in organizations, we really should try to make everything else in the organization we do consistent with that culture. If we don't, and, we, and we, we have localized cultures, like a sales culture, based on the incentive system, newest incentive system, we run the risk, for example, of having two million bank accounts opened just as part of that culture. Even though the larger culture is a culture of caring and a culture for customer care, if we start with the larger culture and build the sales culture and the customer service culture around that, we will be more certain to get the outcomes we want and outcomes that are consistent with our mission and our philosophy and the like. Also, as stated by the bottom point, we can use special problems, problems that change all the time. It may be innovation this year, it may be diversity next year, maybe learning thereafter, but we can use those problems and our attempts to address those problems as opportunities to mobilize the larger organization or culture that we were possibly working on three, four, or five years ago. And if our culture isn't in the right direction yet, we can use our ideal culture 
to start thinking about how we're going to carry out and how we're going to shape the problem-specific cultures. When I look at how we can do this, I, of course, look at the organizational culture inventory because that's the one approach to culture I sort of understand very well and always gravitate back to it. Oftentimes, when I think about the organizational culture inventory, particularly the constructive styles, it, it really does occur to me that um, the, the inventory measures all these things that go in, that go on within organizations that are directly relevant to problem solving. They're directly relevant to helping organizations achieve specific outcomes. In fact, many organizations come to us because there's a problem they want to solve, and they want to solve that problem through culture, a problem like engagement, a problem like diversity problem like knowledge management. What they don't realize is that the same culture, the same overarching organizational culture that they may want to strive toward in solving that particular problem that led them to come to us in the first place is also relevant and also directly impactful for the solving of problems in other areas. And literally, what the culture inventory does is, is to measure behaviors that positively or negatively affect problem solving around integration, things like employee engagement, things like teamwork, things like development, and adaptation, problems like innovation, problems like compliance, as well as task performance problems around quality, problems around efficiency, problems around productivity. So my position is becoming more and more that we should link problem-specific cultures and build problem-specific cultures within the context of the larger organizational culture that we're striving for. Sean talked about the circumplex before. Once again, um, styles at the top are oriented toward satisfaction and development on the part of indivi individual members. Styles toward the bottom are more oriented toward and driven by security concerns. On the right-hand side of the circumplex, our 12 styles, our six styles on that side are people-oriented. On the other side, they are more task-oriented. Styles at the top with respect to problem solving. Address problem solving by driving people or encouraging people to think about goals, to think about outcomes, the objectives, what they're trying to achieve, and doing it in a way that's creative, that's open to ideas, that's experimental, that's learning-oriented, self-actualizing. In the process, interacting with each other in ways that are developmental, teaching, explaining, giving positive feedback, rewarding people, humanistic, and working as a team, affiliative. In contrast, the passive defensive styles are basically self-protective styles. And with respect to problem solving, change initiation, decision making, and the like, they're not very productive. People are just going to go along with others, approval, they're going to do what they've always done, conventional. They're going to wait for someone else to make a decision or tell them what the solution is, robbing the group, robbing the organization of their knowledge and expertise, the depend style, or they're just going to avoid the problem altogether, pretending it's going to go away. The self-promoting uh, styles on the aggressive side, the aggressive defensive side, really don't do too much more to facilitate or enable effective problem solving around integration, adaptation, or task performance. In aggressive organizations and in aggressive groups, interestingly, people want to look like they're solving problems, but they are really working to achieve other goals goals like maintaining their own power, style eight, 
are goals like outperforming others or getting their way, style nine, competitive, or styles like perfectionistic, um, having a perfect solution even when a perfect solution is not necessary. Basically, what our feeling is is that the constructive styles are best in terms of overall organizational cultures, and they also do quite well for problem-specific cultures, whether they be safety or adapt adaptation or whatever. Passive styles are not very effective and are not appropriate for problem solving. The aggressive styles are like a coin toss. Sometimes they work, other times they simply don't work. Now, we do know, however, that in most organizations, these three different types of cultures are equally representative across thousands of organizations, and we want to help those organizations to build and accentuate the constructive styles. Summary, in terms of problem-solving performance, what Norman R. F. Meyer called problem-solving effectiveness, the constructive cultures do the best. With our desert survival and subarctic survival and other problem-solving exercises, interestingly, whether solved by teams face-to-face -face or online in virtual teams, constructive teams do the best. They, they come up with the highest quality solutions they come up with solutions that are accepted. The passive teams do the worst. Low quality, low acceptance. Um, tend to come up with solutions very quickly that are not very good in solving the problem. And people really aren't committed to the solutions. They really haven't participated actively in developing them. With uh, the aggressive styles, as I said before, it's random, it's a coin toss. If the, if the people who are the toughest and most aggressive happen to have the best solutions individually, the team and the organization does well. However, there's no correlation between effectiveness of individual solutions and aggressiveness, so in many cases, the solutions are quite poor. And because involvement, participation, influence has been mixed, the acceptance of those solutions is also mixed. Expanding the OCI to specific problems, to specific goals and outcomes. In organizations, I often try to think, what can we do to help organizations build, for example, a risk culture or a reliability culture that really is going to work and truly is aligned with and embedded within the constructive organizational culture they're trying to develop. One thing we do within, organi within organizational culture reports is actually show the relationship of the OCI constructive styles to different outcomes. And consistently, those styles within and actually across organizations are very strongly correlated with problems like adaptation cooperation, integration, in terms of the extent to which people think they've been adequately solved. The other styles, both passive and aggressive, are either not associated with problem-solving effectiveness, based on our correlations, or even negatively related to problem-solving effectiveness. Those correlations, this research, can help organizations fine-tune constructive norms and expectations for specific problems, for specific outcomes. Overall, the constructive styles tend to be associated positively with various outcomes, but there are slight differences in the strength of those correlations depending on what kind of outcome you're looking at. We can re-administer the OCI ideal, the very top one, we can um, ask people, and we've done this with nuclear power plants in many cases, to think about the type of culture, what should be expected 
to maximize reliability and reduce the chances of an accident. And they can come up with their own OCI ideal, irrespective of the research findings we share with them, that tells them exactly which cultural styles to emphasize, not only at the organizational level, but also specifically with respect to safety and reliability. The interesting thing about those profiles, and we have many of them, is that they are more constructive and even less passive and aggressive than the ideal profiles we get in other types of organizations. I find quite interesting. We can also do one other thing. We can, we can write, we can identify, we can think about and delineate very specific behaviors that are outcome, are problem oriented. So this is something I, I did back in the 1990s. I got very heavily into the, the outcome of diversity and the outcome of inclusion. Did a lot of reading, especially around Roosevelt Thomas and um, his approach to redefining diversity. And I, I actually wrote an alternative research form of the OCI that, that was half OCI standard questions and then half other questions that I specifically wrote over a period of time that reflected each of the 12 styles in terms of diversity and in terms of the impact of those styles on diversity. And over time, a number of organizations have used those specific questions to understand better how they can encourage a culture for diversity and inclusion that is constructive and very low in passive and aggressive type behaviors. For the constructive styles, this is just achievement. The top two items are standard OCI items. I, I tried to make those items very brief, very short, and generic in terms of their applicability and application. Think head and plan is one, pursue a standard of excellence is another. Down at the bottom are two of the items around diversity and inclusion that I wrote that are a little bit more complicated, a little bit more wordy, but show how the achievement style can guide behaviors that are productive and effective vis-a-vis -vis inclusion. Opposite of that, this is just one of the passive styles. It's conventional. Again, the top two items are standard OCI items. The bottom two items are based on my readings and my interviews with people around diversity. And these are two conventional type behaviors that work against diversity, they work against inclusion, and they work against the constructive styles. Oppositional, one of the aggressive defensive styles, again at the top, two regular OCI items at the bottom, two items, two sets of behaviors, very specific behaviors, that are oppositional in orientation, they're aggressive defensive, they, they, they help people sort of protect their own status and security, but they don't help other people feel like members of the organization and fit in. So with this third approach, you can expand on the organizational culture inventory by including supplementary items that are directly worded for that problem you're trying to solve or for that objective you're trying to achieve. If and when you do things this way, it'll give you what, what I'm calling embedded cultures. It'll give you an overall organizational culture with problem-specific cultures embedded within that overall culture you are trying so hard to create. In conclusion, just want to talk about very briefly a couple of the benefits of approaching specific problems with an embedded culture as opposed to a bolt-on or sort of an additional culture that goes beyond the organization's own culture. 
People within organizations sometimes look at these extra cultures as sort of the flavor of the month or the latest trend or the latest priority. They, they don't look at them in all cases as being legitimate aspects of the organizational culture. If you embed a culture for diversity or a culture for safety in the larger culture, that brings about legitimacy. It also helps create continuity in terms of the larger organizational culture and I guess more importantly, the values and mission and purpose of the overall organization. It minimizes the amount of conflict between different cultures. It helps and enables the organization, particularly if you have a constructive culture, to alternate between different structures and even different subcultures and different ways of approaching problems because constructive cultures build into an organization more flexibility than to than do defensive cultures. That's my presentation for today, some of our thinking on cultures, cultures that go beyond the macro organizational cultures. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your attention.